So welcome on behalf of MSU Denver, the College of Business, Department of Management and the Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, welcome to Entrepreneurs, Women Entrepreneurs Week. My name is Becky and I'll be the host today. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. And um, one thing, so our guest today is Megan Marsden and she is one of the board members on the Center for Entrepreneurship. So as you learn more about her, you will know what good hands we're in because she's full of so much knowledge, it just blows my mind. So we feel very fortunate that you're part of the Center for Entrepreneurship. So thank you. Okay, so Megan Marsden is co-founder of Veil vale Intimates. And what is the, the logistics company again? Valor Victoria. Valor Victoria, a logistics company. So I'll have you talk more about that also. Okay, Megan knew from a young age she wanted to impact business and eventually run her own companies. Within a few short years of working for others, she founded several of her own companies by her mid-20s. Her career path has always been influenced by challenging traditional ways of doing business and innovating processes and products in international logistics, healthcare, real estate, and now apparel. Vail Intimates provides inclusive sizing support in women's foundations and sports bras with a mass customization approach, filling the white space between the traditional support of an underwire and the customer's desire for comfort. Through engineering simulation, Vale Intimates has leveraged the knowledge of biomechanics for a more thoughtful approach of customized support. They've worked with Fashion Institute of Technology in preparation to go to market through their research relationship, which is really awesome. Vail is working now with top brands in sports foundations, oh, sports foundations and swim to bring their innovative innovations to consumers. So um, I met Megan because she was the person who helped me sell my business. So, you know, if Megan had two hours, she could tell you all the different businesses she's been involved in. And she just kind of a I would say a master of a whole bunch of different things, really good at a whole bunch of different things, which seem to be very cross-disciplinary. So thank you so much for being with us today. I am just thrilled that you're here. So I'd like you to tell us about, you know, we'll talk, let's talk about the Veil Intimates thing because that affects, you know, most of us here, most of us ladies. And then, you know, how did you get into that business? What inspired you to start the business? Yeah, absolutely. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to talk to you about my experience and hopefully have a dynamic dialogue with you on questions that I can answer or what you're thinking about as maybe for yourselves in entrepreneurship. But as Becky said, I've um, had the entrepreneur bug since I was little. Actually, my Barbie was running her own talent agency when I was seven. So I always had uh, an interest in business. I come from a business uh, family, people who owned companies and worked in business. And so I saw what that was like and just felt like that was the mountaintop I was supposed to live on. Um, but Vail happened, uh, Vail Intimates. My friend and I were shopping uh, for bras at a summer sale, sidewalk sale in Cherry Creek and said why are and then had coffee and said why are bras still so uncomfortable or unfortunate looking like they were never both great looking um and also comfortable and why was this and this was uh five years ago so places like lively and third love and those brands didn't exist at the time and uh so we thought certainly we could figure out how to do it better and so we had no experience in apparel both of us had come from uh, corporate America and business. And I had founded some other companies that were outside of the apparel space. So how to feel for how to launch a company and do financial modeling and companies and understand sort of the business model. And we really just started venturing out and networking, figuring out how uh, we could learn about the apparel industry and manufacturing, why things were made the, w the way they were. We had this sort of gut instinct of how to fix it. Uh, so this vision of how to create support inside of bras that would be different than what women were experiencing at, from any time before. And so we just spent a lot of time talking and listening and asking questions 
and uh, through many, many people who were very uh, generous to us with their time and willingness to help us. We got connected and pointed in the right direction, both people in the apparel industry and just business mentors that gave us advice on how to move forward if we were stuck. So our, the first place we wanted to start was effectively our gut instinct, uh, creating um, scientific simulation to know that what we felt in our gut of how to do this was actually be scientifically accurate. And so we had engineering team help us uh, create modeling for women, uh, women's bodies and the dynamics that we face in our tissue, whether we're standing, walking, running in a side plank in yoga, what does that look like? And then integrating our uh, idea into the simulation to prove that it did actually solve uh, issues, which in engineering, which was not my background either, I learned a lot, uh, but stress, strain, and deformation, really those engineering terms mean, you know, pain, discomfort, and bounce. And so what was happening when a woman was wearing a bra, uh, you know, and how could we do it better? So we figured that out from a simulation, got validation there, put it on ourselves in prototypes, felt like we knew it uh, was something, got stuck, wasn't sure where to go next and how to really uh, go into the apparel industry. Being in Colorado, it's not, it may be very uh, burgeoning for outdoor and active sports, but it is not a lingerie hub or uh, maybe even a sports bra hub of, of the world. And so a great mentor of ours told us, hey, you need to call academia and you need to call the best universities uh, in apparel. And so we picked up the phone and called Fashion Institute of Technology. We cold called uh, their head of external partnerships. She said, I'll give you 15 minutes. We flew to New York for a 15 minute meeting to talk to FIT. And an hour and a half later into that meeting, they said, you have something, we wanna help you. And so my heart will always, uh, before academia, helping entrepreneurs launch into the marketplace because there are expert professors that know a lot about uh, industries maybe that you aren't an expert in. And so we formed a partnership with FIT uh, where they helped us with their professor team do some testing and uh, do a uh, study on women in New York. So actually putting our product on and doing a wear test, giving us feedback that also opened the doors into the apparel industry because one of the women we worked alongside that was a graduate student had a twin sister, oddly, that was the former vice president of sports at Victoria's Secret. So she had a 30 year career specifically in foundations and we wanted her uh, to consult for us. She saw our product and said, I wanna partner with you. I wanna be a partner. And we said, we'd love to have you. And so because of her experience in the industry and that connection, just the ongoing connection of networking, doors opening, um, we've been able to uh, work alongside some of the largest brands in both sports and foundation and swim to integrate our product in. So our business model is not actually to be a brand or to compete with existing brands, but rather to work alongside those brands who have great, great brand equity already, who are doing a lot of things right help them elevate their game uh, to provide a support system for women in foundations, swim and sport uh, into their garments. And so we've been also going into the medical industry. A FIT relationship opened up doors at Columbia University, NYU. And we are working on a clinical trial for individuals to detect the success of their oncology treatments for breast cancer. So it allows these sensors to integrate into our product and send information to the cloud to doctors on what's happening uh, to their tissue when they're receiving treatment uh, real time. So if someone receives chemo on Monday, they wear a garment Tuesday, Wednesday, 30, Thursday for 20 minutes each day and can see the changes in their cells to ensure that their treatments are accurate. So. We are going deep into the medical space now. Um, it's something that we always wanted to do, creating customized 3D printed bras for women who've had mastectomy was also something we were very uh, interested in just from familial experiences uh, with breast cancer. So that is how we got into the crazy apparel industry. It was just knocking on doors, a whole lot of networking and a whole lot of amazing people that were experts 
thought we had something and were willing to help. So I love this. In, in fact, um, I remember the day that I was at a trade. I was at the trade show taking students and I ran into you guys uh, at the in this in the like sourcing department. Yes. In, in Vegas at the trade show. And you guys were, you know, just seeing what was out there. I mean, like, that's the place you start. You go and see who's already making what you want to make. And that's a place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So we were, we did go to a trade shows to understand sourcing and manufacturing where stuff was being made because ultimately we're an innovation component company. And so we had to understand who was making components, what they were putting out that was innovation. A lot of that isn't domestic US companies. Mm -hmm. So the best way to see it was at an international trade show. Uh, Magic for us is the apparel show and there's a sourcing specific um, show there. So it's a very large, very large show that helps us understand what was happening from a component perspective. And then also they had an intimate show called Curve which had swim and uh, lingerie so we could check out to see what was coming out in the next seasons was there anything interesting or competitive from an innovation perspective uh, just to keep our eye on the pulse and understand were we already creating something that someone was already ahead of us creating or was this something completely new mm, fantastic hey so um the other thing you mentioned you mentioned working with engineers and um how, tell us a little bit about that, considering that they were probably men. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, thankfully we unearthed some pretty amazing engineers um, who understood what we were driving to and okay with having some uncomfortable conversations about bras and breast movement. Uh, but you can imagine, I think the first meeting we had with some engineers, we had to like pull out a bra and show them what we were even talking about in regards to componentry because they hadn't been intimately aware. I mean, rightly so, hadn't been intimately aware of, of the challenges women face in regards to underwire specifically, as well as just compression garments. And so uh, trying to explain what we were trying to create and the problems we were trying to solve really involved a lot of dialogue and a showing of garments and walking them through what we were looking to achieve. But uh, biomechanical engineers are doing testing on, you know, it does that joint work, does the, you know, for a knee replacement. So it's just a different set of um, biology that we were working on and, and part of mapping. But yeah, it was, it took, it was a little bit of a runway to explain what we were actually facing. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Hey, so what have been some of your biggest challenges in this process? Yeah, so I think the biggest challenge is that we came from outside the industry. So it just took more time and patience to like unearth the right network of people to help open the doors. I think we would get stuck and then we would reach out to business mentors to say, hey, we're stuck in this area. Um, how do we how do we find a way? And the, the way was my favorite answer to this is we have a great mentor whose name is Ed Barbera. He's successful, has bought and sold and started many companies. And um, he said to create a list, like, you know, identify your problem, think of who could help you solve that problem and create a list of people or organizations from the best organization you possibly could think of to solve that problem all the way to the bottom and then start at the top and start calling them. Look, start you know, with the best. Start with the best. Oh like, my God. That's we so were, yeah. And he's like, you might get to 85 and then that's your solution, but you might get to number five and they say, yeah, I want to help you. Or this is what I think. And so uh, we were trying to solve locally, which I do like doing stuff locally. In some ways it happens faster, but in this new environment, it's really kind of immaterial mm -hmm. um, where things are happening because so much is happening like this on video. Um, so really we we started to create lists when we would come up against a problem and say, who can help us solve it and just start listing it out and picking up the phone. And so you'd be surprised how many mentors there are that have had success that are really willing to open their network to help solve problems. And so there's been countless problems, um, figuring out patents, figuring out sourcing, figuring out material, chemistries, um, who can open the door in the apparel industry. I mean, I think in entrepreneur and business, uh, 
you always have something that you're looking to solve. And so it's also being able to articulate what's that one thing that if I met with someone, I would be able to articulate to say, help me with this thing. And like, you may have 35 problems, but be able to articulate one. So when you're talking to people, you'll get to that solution faster. Um, so those two things really helped us overcome challenges. I mean, getting into the apparel industry, we weren't sure what that would be like, but it's been very, very um, welcoming. And um, it's a very, very small industry. A lot of the same people, um, you know, it, it's probably really a couple hundred people that manage intimate apparel in the world. And so uh, it's a small group and they all know each other. So it was just breaking into that. And by having uh, Heather as our partner who uh, had great experience and great know-how and is an innovator, she hold, holds patents herself in apparel and innovation. So um, it was just finding that right person. Well, the interesting thing is um, when I when I used to teach the business of fashion, I would say that there is no real there's no such thing as patenting clothing. And so it, so what you're doing is different from that. So explain like how that differs from, you know, why a person doesn't normally get a patent when you're talking about apparel. Yeah. So the difference there is different kinds of patents. Right. So there is design patents, which are very hard to enforce, right? So the reason apparel in the business of fashion is hard to create patents on is because they could move a stitch by a centimeter and then they're not infringing on your design. So, uh, or, you know, slightly modify some things. Um, and there's really nowhere to go legally after those people. Um, but we have a utility patent. So utility patent basically is what the purpose is of what you're making and how you make it. And so that is really what we were able to patent our innovation on is how we make what we make and what the purpose of that uh, making that is. And so we started with a patent search um, and then ha just have a fantastic legal team that walked us through the path of, of getting a patent. Uh, I think, um, the success rate of achieving a patent is about 66% um, in the United States. And then also we have filed globally. So we filed domestically in the US, got our patent from the US Patent Office, and then at the same time filed in uh, various countries for protection. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So um, so to, can you tell us, can you tell us, us about what this is like what what is this technology and how does it look and how did you come up with a solution and the interesting thing is you had you had aspects that you had to consider like the fact that people wash and dry these things so it had to be something because people wash and dry correct yeah so uh while we were at, in regards to the wash dry and the different aspects so a lot of the work we did was understanding chemistry so as non-engineers non-chemists just business people we had a lot of catching up to do on understanding chemistry and uh, the raw material that we were utilizing and how to get it to achieve what we wanted to achieve. And so we knew we wanted to create a support system inside the cup. So I have some show and tell. Yay, I'm glad you do. So this is a client's very large bra, but basically, uh, you know, Everyone, most people on the call should know what this is. This is a bra, a traditional foundation. It's a wire free, but basically uh, we always felt like why was support happening, you know, here? Why was it always happening at the very bottom or through the band or the wing? Um, and we felt like it should be happening throughout the cup. So why weren't we creating a support system inside the cup here um, to support tissue at its greatest point uh, of, gravity. And so really we came up with this idea to create uh, something like this. This isn't exactly what we have, but it's just a little example. Um, so leveraging biomimicry. So really studying nature and nature support system and how to use that to create a geometry that could go inside of a bra and basically support the tissue uh, like a sling a little bit um, inside the cup, but also have it be completely invisible to the wearer. So uh, the wearer wouldn't understand why it's supported better. She just knew it did. Um, so it might look something like this inside the cup. 
where it would support through uh, across uh, the tissue. So uh, that's a little bit where a component, it, it, we 3D print is a big part of our strategy. Um, we can make this product in, in various manufacturing methodologies, but we really believe in the future of sustainability by creating the exact number of components perfectly measured into the bra. Um, so we're not wasting raw material and we're not wasting units by creating uh, minimums and maximums for clients. Um, so if someone needed 80,264 pieces, that's how many we make. Um, and this really allows us to be flexible in our geometry design, um, creating customized pieces for each client. And this geometry changes based on, um, it can be as custom as per woman. It can be as mass customized as us understanding the engineering and science behind uh, breast tissue weight and movement and creating segments. So if you know an A and a B need the, about the same support for tissue, we can change this geometry to support someone who's a B cup the same way someone who's a K cup is supported. And so really that's where our heart and vision for inclusive sizing, ensuring that women of all sizes can have a wire-free experience that's actually supportive. Um, and they can have comfort in that too. And this can go into uh, any style of product. It can go into water. We did wash and wear testings at FIT in their science lab. We did a ton of testing on material integration. How can we make the garment have more longevity? Uh, I think myself, like many people, like once you fall in love with a garment and it's like your go-to style, you want it to last. And so how could we be a part of it lasting instead of the wire poking out or sort of all these things that cause, the, cause uh, apparel to break down. How can we par be, be a part of a sustainable solution that would have garments last longer? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it looks like uh, as an example, but it's an infinite, uh, infinite numbers of geometries. This is another one uh, that's more sports. So it can um, support above and below at reducing bounce. So we have various really varied amounts of geometries just through years and years of study and research and understanding the geometries to create support. We live in a really, really thin landscape. So you think 3D printing, you sometimes think that it would have to be printed in uh, sort of a curved aspect, but we print, print flat. Um, and then it really molds to the body uh, in, in a curved way and can be inserted in it. But um, our geometries are pretty uh, infinitely unlimited. So the solution that it's printed in, are, is that consistent? Is it always the same solution? Yeah, so uh, part of one of our business thoughts was, okay, do we wanna keep changing the chemistry to create different levels of support or do we wanna change the geometry to change different levels of support? And for us, keeping the same chemistry, um, having it be able to achieve what we wanna achieve in wash and dry, uh, wearability, return, uh, tensile strength, all the sort of markers of chemistry and engineering, if we if that remains constant, really we work through the geometries to change um, what happens. So if someone wants to create a lift or they're trying to uh, move tissue to a certain place, we change the geometry um, to achieve those things as well as if they're trying to create a you know max support, moderate support or min support. It's really about changing the, the geometries from our perspective versus changing uh, the chemistry fo formulation. Also because we have a desire to really press the industry forward into sustainable formulations. So product that is biodegradable um, or uh, you know can be recycled. We would prefer to really press into a chemistry that can do all of those things, commit to that chemistry, and then adjust our design accordingly to achieve different things. Nice. So that is, is it, so it is biodegradable? It How is cyclable. We're working on biodegradable. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So somebody would have to pull it out of the interior. Like say you have a cotton bra. I've been just reading Cradle to Cradle and Upcycle recently, and they talk about a lot of things in order for them to be properly recycled have to be taken apart. So like if you have that structure in a cotton sports bra, you'd, you know, the cotton would, well, it would be cotton lycra. So part of it would degrade, part of it would not. And yeah, 
Uh huh. There is a, a brand that we're working with that's an emerging brand. Um, we are talking about like if there was a thread that was a specific color and you could pull the thread when you were done with your bra and it would open up the side seam and you could literally pull it out and put it in your recycling bin. So how can we how can we educate end consumers? I think we're all uh, passionate about what can this look like in the future with apparel and recycling mm -hmm. and not recycling, but also creating products that have longevity. But when that longevity has ceased, you know, being mindful of that sustainability, I would say every single brand we talk to, that is their number one thing they're working on right now, which is really encouraging. That is really encouraging. Oh my gosh, that's so good. So would you say, I, I know you can't disclose much about much about the formulation, but is it like a silicone based product or what would you say? It's, elast it's an elastomer it's an elastopolymer basically. So it's, uh, it would be a, a bridge between a silicone and a rubber. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. But super lightweight, like basically light as a feather, you can scrunch it up and it will return to its shape. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so like, no folding the bra perfectly with the underwire. You could literally throw this in your gym bag and then it will return. Okay. Ooh, good. No. So why the different colors? Um, these are different formulations. So these colors can be whatever color we want them to be. Um, some brands like the idea of, you know, it being showcased, some like it really hidden. So it's just, um, it's just different formulations that we're working on right now. Okay. Hey, the question now I have is about, is about pivoting, but I want to, I want to, I want to start because I remember what, in the very beginning, you guys were thinking about doing a bra line, like a comfortable bra line. And it seems to me over the last five years, there have been these just unbelievably, like it, it, it's taking you down like this path of, of gigantic uh, shifts and discoveries. And I mean, it's been amazing watching you and Nancy go through these pivots that make it bigger and bigger and more impactful and more important every step of the way. So you led the way, like the, you, were, you started off thinking, we need to make bras that are more comfortable. And now you're changing the bra industry forever. Yes. So talk about the different pivots in that. Yeah. So I think we initially, when we were looking at it, had this interest in creating a line um, specifically for the medical industry, for women who've experienced mastectomy um, or any medical procedures, because there was really not a good process for those women. So you basically, you know, go to the doctor's office and have your procedure as an then you kind of have to go out into the world and find the product. But there was no line that was like being sold through doctor's offices or working alongside doctors to create this experience uh, for the garment that when women had had those procedures, had, you know, mastectomy, where was she going to go? How was she going to find it? There are stores who service those women, but it wasn't really happening along an ease. Like it wasn't like these are all the garments you're going to need um, through your process. And so it originally started like, yeah, I think we're going to need to create a line. And then as we networked and understood, people said, hey, you have something here that I think could be used outside of medical. It could be used just wire free generally. And the more we understood the market, the more we realized that it's pretty crowded. Like as we were going through that five year time, a lot of new brands were launching in this kind of wire free, like the Livelys. Third Love, True & Co. were all emerging really as comfort brands that were more size inclusive, um, but they didn't have a lot of innovation behind them, right? So they were uh, creating these new brands. Some of it was more like data-driven fit sort of things, like data companies who happen to sell intimate apparel um, or products that didn't involve innovation. They were just thoughtful design. And so as we kind of walked through it and doors opened, we realized we should really be working on the whole industry and it would be better for us to not be a brand, but we could serve more people. Like our, our goal was how many women can we help have a better experience with comfortable bras, right? And so um, we realized we could serve more if we, if we created this product that could go inside of bras. And then really we were like, well, we're not really manufacturers. It would be great to license this 
And then just learning about the industry. Some customers really love that licensing structure because they're really big conglomerates who have a really tight supply chain of manufacturing, but other customers just need us to make it. And so then it was like, well, we better learn how to manufacture and find manufacturing partners. And so uh, never started out on this journey thinking, hey, we're going to be a component company um, creating innovation for the apparel industry. But when you see uh, what's happening in the industry and you see this, uh, the business strategy unfold um, where there is opportunity for more growth, for more touch points, um, you know, we originally started looking at the medical vertical and now, you know, we have four verticals um, and more and more opportunity is coming where our innovation, our foundational patent uh, can also be used in other applications in apparel. And so how can we use our know-how for bras to support in various, um, various kinds of apparel? And so it's even growing beyond just our intimates. Um, in the verticals we're in now, but into new apparel segments that were unexpected, uh, unplanned, and you know, clients asked us to help them figure it out. And so, um, because we have the knowledge of the science behind movement and lift and support, it can be cross applied uh, to other apparel segments. So, so your verticals, so you, your four verticals, one is medical, one is like standard bras. Yep. What are the other two? Sportswear. So sports bras mm -hmm. and then swimwear. And swim. Oh my gosh. And then, and then what about, oh, and then you said other pair of like strapless dresses, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, um, leggings or oh. men's underwear or name something yeah. yeah hey well now what about military at one point i knew i heard you guys were 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 talking to the military possibly is that something you can share or yeah so that really is in the medical we could view that as medical application so how to integrate technology into our support system to track medical things whether it's like pulse ox heart rate um, all that kind of stuff that could maybe be utilized uh, in fire, EMT, or police. Um, there's a lot of vitals that need to be tracked when people are going into different environments. Um, and how can we leverage what we know and what we have patented for those applications? Hmm. So. Wow, that's so cool. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I feel like okay, the question is have you faced any challenges in this business because you're a woman? Yeah, I don't think we have necessarily because we're women. I think the bigger thing, because we're in intimates, there's a lot of women in intimates. <laughs> so it's mostly women in intimates. Yeah. So our industry really is uh, female heavy. I think just being an entrepreneur is pretty hard. I, I will say like that you you always have a challenge in front of you and you're always problem solving. And so I don't think there's anything necessarily because uh, in the intimate space, because um, were women, I think, um, you know, we have been very fortunate that people have wanted to help us um, and help network us, us. So I haven't, I can't say that I have specifically seen any challenges because I'm a woman in this industry as generally as entrepreneur. I think there's some industries um, that aren't, that are uh, not women dominated. And in some ways it's served us because we can tread low and quietly, um, maybe uh, maybe not expected to achieve what we achieve. And so it's actually benefited us to be underestimated. Oh. Um, so I think there's some aspects of it that have actually benefited us versus hindered us. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that has been in other businesses, but I'm thankful for it because it allowed us to sort of grow quietly. Um, and then maybe at first people didn't take us seriously or underestimated us, but um, come out very successful. And then those same people maybe who didn't know or underestimated, I don't even know if they did, but felt like it was underestimation, um, then become your biggest supporters because you've proven that you can do it uh, through your success. So um, I, I haven't, I think entrepreneurship is, is a, is something that you're called to do and it can be very challenging um, but also extremely rewarding and so I think 
it's just uh, can be generally taxing um, and just require a lot of resilience and and liking to solve problems and being committed to the vision. Oh, I love that. Hey, that's that leads me into the next question. These days, people have to be good at really a lot of things like, you know, we can't just be an accountant like these days there are so many things you have to be able to do. So what are some of the things that you do best like resiliency? I heard you say, what are some of the other things? Yeah, so I'm fortunate. I had a really good corporate career that taught me a lot of business. So I had foundational business stuff uh, with my family where I had since I was little, my dad was teaching me about business. Um, and I really enjoyed it. But in my corporate life, I was a salesperson. And so sales, you know, is, is a necessary part of any business. <laughs> and so um, my like probably key strength as a person is a, being a salesperson and being able to sell ideas, which can be selling it to create partnerships or vendors or networking. Sales is just a discipline that's really good to have in your back pocket. And then I sort of grew into other disciplines because I needed to learn those things in business. So um, at the logistics company, I'm not really in a sales function. I'm more in a, a CFO, COO function. So uh, executing on strategy and financials became a big part of that. And then the business brokerage, uh, Becky, where we know each other, where I we help people buy and sell businesses, understanding valuation. So I've just had a lot of experience in a lot of different industries, but business is the same is business is business the fundamentals of business are the same regardless of of the industry so um you know finance is an important discipline that i'm always curious and learning about different business models and strategies and understanding margin and how uh how to make something profitable and successful and not just create a business that has a great idea but actually can perform in, in a profitable way um and then uh, sales, being able to sell that idea, that product, that service uh, to people who who, who uh, are going to be the consumer of it, but also could partner in it, whether it's a vendor, um, an academic institution saying, yeah, I want to help you. I think we're always uh, selling uh, our vision and our strategy. Um, you know, my favorite thing to do is, is, stra is strategy and uh, plan for future and how we can make things better, which I think is just uh, part of my personality um, and why we're creators of innovation that hasn't existed before. So. Oh, I love that. He said, tell us, tell us a little bit about your logistics business. What is that? Yeah. Tell us about that. Sure. So um, the logistics company was founded three years ago by uh, my husband's cousin, who I just call my cousin because she's, she's virtually my sister. Um, and she had this vision uh, of how to change how logistics was happening in the United States uh, by landing freight closer to end distribution centers and had done this in a large corporation, uh, created a private facility where trains were moving in and out of. And she went to that large corporation and said, hey, I, I would like to do this um, across the country. And they said, that's not really what we do, but you should go do that. She had never wanted to start a business, never wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, but had this great idea and said, hey, I know you know this, you know business, you know entrepreneurship, my husband and myself. And she said, hey, uh, would you help? And my corporate career was in logistics. So my uh, most of my corporate life, I was uh, working for a Fortune 500 logistics company in the healthcare vertical and said, hey, I have a lot of experience in logistics. Let me come alongside you. But I also have this other experience in you know, financial modeling, uh, building teams, working in technology, uh, all that business setup, patents, the whole gamut of that. And so I, I joined her as her COO uh, and we launched the company three years ago and became operational in uh, December, 2019 and began moving freight uh, into various markets, specifically the first place we moved freight into is Iowa. And so uh, working with large, large, huge shippers to move international freight in and out and match um, those assets. So those containers that come into the US uh, with our products from Amazon and Target, making sure that we can export uh, US exports into them um, back out. And so we just match assets um we like rural markets and 
it's been a very interesting business, learned a lot, uh, really love it. We work with um, really large companies. Uh, you would know the names of where you buy most of your products and then um, mid-sized companies that are manufacturing in rural markets like Iowa and um, class one railroads and ocean carriers, the whole gamut of the supply, international logistics supply chain. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how you, how you do it. That's just amazing to me. Wow. I like diversity, right? So I like uh, challenges. I like problem solving. There's always problems to solve, ways to look at th doing things differently. Yeah, no doubt. Well, hey, um, so that kind of makes me makes me wonder how has how has COVID affected you in in all these businesses? Yeah, so some have been challenging uh, because of the dynamics of for like logistics, how people purchase things, just shifted how the international logistics market was working. Um, but for the bra company, it's been really positive because usually our meetings would be in person. Um, most brands are not in Denver. And so we would have to you know, fly to New York or LA or uh, the Pacific Northwest to meet people in person. And this sort of cadence of virtual meetings allowed us to meet with a lot of people a lot quicker. I think it freed up a lot of time on people's calendars that were travel warriors um, to be able to have meetings faster. So in some ways it's, it's truly benefited us because uh, we've been able to move forward with brands faster because of this virtual meeting space. Um, that is, is just business as normal in, in the business world today. I think it's been, um, also good for us because people are looking how to manufacture things differently. Supply chains were really shook when uh, COVID happened and factories were shutting down. So, uh, you know, stopping to make everything you have, the components they couldn't get, the fabric, the people weren't making the end product and trying to catch up with that. I think it was challenging uh, that some teams were uh, restructured during COVID because of the challenges of business. And so people, who are maybe on an innovation team, the in innovation team no longer existed. And uh, but some people were let go and now a different team was in charge of innovation. So where we had traction sort of paused and we had to reintroduce concept to a new team. So um, some good and some bad. I mean, I think like most people um, were adapting um, and I'm a glass half full person. So I'm gonna say mostly good. Nice. I do like the idea of popping into somebody's day for the 15 minute call that doesn't require a day traveling both directions and, you know, paying a lot of money for flights and stuff. So it, it, it is almost miraculous in that way. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's probably for us been the biggest thing because almost I can't, all of our clients aren't here in Denver. And so actually having this be a, a preferred way of interface or an acceptable way of interface allows meetings to just happen so much faster. And that's across all of my businesses. Um, it really allows for a business, the cadence of business to move more quickly by not having to fly. I, I do miss the face-to-face -face interaction because some of the best parts of business are getting to know people. And that just doesn't happen when there's, you know, 33 of us on a call. Um, you don't get to know people, uh, uh, and understand who they are as people. And I'm an extrovert. So that's um, sometimes been hard where I don't get that additional interaction of getting to know people. But Oh, yeah. Hey, so, um, so what is in, what's interesting for me is the fact that you guys have been doing this for a long time, and you're almost on the cusp, like you're almost have product out there. But because of your component, um, okay, what what people don't realize is how long it takes from start to finish for a product to be prototyped, to be sold, manufactured and delivered, that is like a six month process from start to finish. But actually it's usually a year when you're actually researching and coming up with the product, coming up with the product, you show it at a trade show. So it's like a year at least to get um, a physical uh, garment on the market. And you guys are kind of now at that point where they're putting your product into the development of the product of their product. So when do you see your, like something coming out with your technology in it? Yeah, spring, uh, fall right now, we're working on one that could be fall 2021. Uh, another one spring 2022. It just depends on the brand. Some people have a very 
quick innovation calendar where there's other brands. I mean, some innovation, seven years, seven years from, yeah, from idea ideation or even proto. It, I mean, it could be fully flushed proto from a company, but then to begin with that company, it's seven years till it's hitting the market. Mm -hmm. So there is brands that are uh, known for their innovation that uh, spend a lot of time ensuring that it will um, execute the way they want it to execute and that they'll have success in that. And usually when it's sped up is when it doesn't work out. And so it just, it takes time to flush through making and refining a product to be really successful. And a lot of those long innovation pipelines are for very large companies who have complex supply chains mm -hmm. and just a, a large market share. And so when they are launching a product, they're gonna make sure that it's successful. They're gonna spend the time and take the care to ensure that you know, one, one bra that's made uh, over here and another bra that's made over here, that it's the same consumer experience. Um, and so just when you get into these uh, very, very large brands, they just take a lot of time and care on innovation. Um, there's other brands that recognize that don't have the innovation infrastructure within their teams that recognize that we've spent five years validating and knowing it and we don't need, um, it's good to be put in product. Uh, it can be executed well. There's just other brands who have that innovation team that do the testing and uh, spend the time on that. So it can be anywhere from eight months to seven years. One innovation I know it's 10 years uh, pipeline to market. So yeah, it's pretty wild. Oh my gosh, that's just so, that's crazy. Hey, so where do you see yourself going in the next year and the next five years? What do you what do you see for yourself? Yeah, so we're evolving as a company into these additional ver verticals, which is kind of interesting. Um, and having clients that we're working with on our uh, cornerstone uh, innovation, asking us to help with new innovations. And so it's really pushing ourselves outside of what we know and the scope of, of that uh, segment of apparel and pushing beyond that. And so really this next year, it's us coming alongside brands um, and what we're doing currently um, and launching into market and really, uh, you know, working through the manufacturing process for some brands, working through helping manufacturers execute it with other brands. Um, five years, you know, uh, the medical space takes a long time. It's a long, uh, a long time cycle to have, you know, a clinical trial and get FDA uh, more clinical trials. So we have our first clinical trial happening um, this fall, and then there'll be three subsequent kind of clinical trials, which will happen in 2022. Um, and then going through FDA processing of that, uh, we will be the commercial arm for uh, these sensor technologies. So working with academia, um, a lot of academics have their IP and the idea, but they uh, don't necessarily have the skill set or the desire to take things commercially to market. And so that's you know part of what we're trying to understand. Do we want to build a brand to facilitate the medical side of what we sort of began with? Um, do we want to partner with a medical company uh, and kind of put the package together to license this uh, innovation into the marketplace? So uh, medical side just takes a, a large time, uh, amount of time, uh, rightly so. And so that's something that we'll be working on over the the next handful of years uh, as one of our, our other verticals. But then with uh, opening up of new apparel options, uh, who knows where that could take us, what brands that could take us into um, building innovation for different parts of apparel. There's also been talk of this being outside of apparel and utilized uh, in various ways. So um, always thinking how we could leverage what we know and, and creating support uh, across many industries. Oh, wow. That is just fantastic. So, um, the whole thing's kind of surprising, but is there something you'd share that really surprised you and would really surprise us about your business? I think the thing, the thing that surprised me is I, I, I felt like I most of the time didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. And I think a lot of people feel that way and that's completely normal. So that I don't feel like that should maybe surprise anyone. I think the surprising thing is I still don't feel like I necessarily know what I'm doing most of the time because I'm constantly going into new places that I've never been in business, right? I'm opening doors that I've never opened. I'm solving challenges I've never solved. 
And so I think you can have years of experience in business and still feel like you don't really know exactly what you're doing, but you're, you're figuring it out. And so I think that may be a surprising and hopefully encouraging to people when they get into things and it's feeling very uncomfortable. Like I've, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, my history, I, I have a lot of business history and have done a lot of things, but almost every one of those things I did, I didn't know what I was doing when I started. I had to learn as I went. Um, I had people speaking in and helping me, but uh, I still made mistakes regularly. Uh, I still make mistakes. And so I think the biggest thing I could say that might surprise people is there's days that I, I have a lot of knowledge. I know a lot of about our product and what we're doing, but there are definitely moments that I still don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what the right answer is for the strategy. Uh, I still don't know who the right partner is. Um, and that I kind of, we figure it out as we go. And I think that's very normal in business. And so I just want to normalize that. So it's no longer surprising that when you're doing business, most of the time you're doing something for the first time and you, you're figuring it out as you go. Wow. Yes. That's great. Great. Absolutely. That's really good. Good. Good to know. Oh my gosh. All right. So this will be our, this is going to be our last official question. And then, um, and, and if you guys uh, in the audience want to add questions to the chat, please go ahead and do that so that I can ask those. Everything you say blows my mind. So I, I'm like, oh my God, I just can't even believe it. Um, so this is the last official question. And then at, at some point, you know, we'll ask some, you know, questions of the audience, but I'd, I'd like you to put that in the chat rather than being able to speak up because we have to, for privacy reasons, we have to keep everybody sort of um, mics off and cameras off. Um, so I'd like to, what would you say your, your advice is for new entrepreneurs starting a business? What would your advice be? Yeah, so um, for me, I was not meant to be a solopreneur. So I have business partners that um, I've known for a long time, uh, like my husband's cousin and uh, my best friend is uh, my partner in my bra company. And we had worked together in corporate America before. Um, but I really like a team uh, in business to help offset maybe your weaknesses. So really finding people who, who do that for you. Um, but if, you know, being a founder is part of your strategy, I would say um, start networking and finding people who uh, can give you advice. Like I said, a lot of times if you're going into a new industry and even if you're not, if you're the most experienced person Starting a company is a lot different than working in corporate America and uh, working in an existing company. Um, and so just building that network, um, what I, I call it my board of directors, but they're not officially our board of directors of our company, but they're more my board of directors for my life of mentors who I can pick up the phone and ask the questions and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I can't find this solution. I'm trying to, I've been trying to problem solve this. I can't figure it out. What advice do you have? Um, just building that network of people is super important. Um, being able to articulate your vision, but being willing willing to be nimble in that is, is important. I think um, some people get really rigid in, in what it's going to be. And not every business idea is a profitable business. And so there can be really good ideas and you have to sort of look at the business structure to ensure that you can get for it to being a profitable business where it makes sense. Um, and sometimes those ideas just don't equate to that. And so there's always a new idea. There's always a new thing uh, to be passionate about. Um, and so find that thing that you're really passionate about and makes a profitable business model and strategy, and then be willing to learn uh, as you go and be nimble to what that looks like. Wow, great. Oh my gosh, great advice. Oh. Megan, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you to be here and to share all that you've shared. It's been just amazing. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a fun ride being on an entrepreneurial journey. That's for sure. I know. It's so amazing. Okay.